So it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Carolyn Chenoweth from Fresenius uh, Medical Care. Um, hemodialysis is another area which is um, interesting perhaps in terms of its work group. It's the patients are pretty stable. The staff are usually pretty stable. A lot of what they do is rather complex, but it's also sort of regularised. And how do you build hand hygiene into that system? And we've asked Carolyn to talk about that. Thanks. Our hand hygiene program, I call it a holistic hand hygiene program, because hand hygiene is part of everything we do in hemodialysis, especially the foundation of our IPC program. So hand hygiene is related to aseptic technique. It supports our general IPC audits. Our IPC champions enables the hand hygiene and IPC programs. Patient involvement is very important with our hand hygiene. We're also looking at measuring outcomes and future plans. So this is just a bit of a background of our dialysis clinics. We've got 19 dialysis clinics around Australia. So we cover all states and territories except um, Tasmania. So just a bit of a background about the haemodialysis patient. So dialysis patients are especially vulnerable to healthcare associated infections. One, because they've got a chronic renal failure, so they're already immunocompromised. They come in for haemodialysis treatments about three times per week at least. So they've got frequent exposure to healthcare facilities, healthcare workers and other patients. They come into dialysis, the first thing we do is cannulate them. So invasive procedures, which induces um, potential for bloodstream infections and bloodborne viruses. Our patients are getting older. The average age of our patients is mid-60s, even older. We're putting patients on dialysis in their 90s. They have comorbidities. A lot of them have got cardiac and um, diabetes issues. So education is a very important part of the program. So we aim to have um, annual education, which includes the Hand Hygiene Australia online learning package, practical competencies based on the Hand Hygiene Australia's uh, competency. We aim to have all the clinical staff, so everybody in the dialysis clinics, we aim to have um, do the education. So that's the nurses, clinical managers, doctors, allied health, even the non-clinical staff. So that's administration, patient assistants and the volunteers. So the auditors are a very important part of our program. So we aim to have a minimum of two hand hygiene auditors in each clinic. So we aim for that because then if one hand hygiene auditor is away, the other one can still do the work. They can audit each other. They can support each other in trying to work out, you know, should this be a moment two or a moment one. Um, we do like to have the uh, clinic manager uh, trained auditor as well because then they really support the program. So with this training, we've identified we had some <coughs> initial problems. So some clinics were not able to access the Hand Hygiene Australia Gold Standard Auditor training. That was either because they were remote, like in Catherine, or sometimes when it was available, it was only available for public health and not for private industry. With Gold Standard Auditors, you can train the staff, uh, they could train the staff in the clinics to audit. Qualified auditors, they'd leave. You get staff turnover and then you train them up and then they'd leave. So some of the solutions we had from that was that Hand Hygiene Australia um, gave me additional training so I could become a super trainer. And then I could go to these areas and train gold standard auditors myself. So I could go to Catherine and run my own workshop there. We continued having the gold standard auditors doing the training, training other auditors and continue to use the Hand Hygiene Australia Gold Standard Auditor training when it was available. So currently across all our clinics we've got 46 trained auditors and you can see it's a bit of a mix between um, Hand Hygiene Australia, myself, um, our own Gold Standard Auditors training and having that helps us to be able to maintain our auditors. So the data collection in dialysis clinics. So for a clinic with greater than 5,000 treatments annually they need 200 moments for an audit period. So that's over about a three month period. And that's the majority of our clinics that we need to do that. So it takes, in hemodialysis, it's an average of 20 minutes to be able to audit 10 audit moments because there's a lot of processes, so it is a lot slower. So to achieve the 200 audit moments over an audit period, the three month period, breaks it down to about seven and a half hours of auditing over that three months. 
I continually um, check how many moments are being done by the clinics and I email the managers saying, you know, you've got this many moments, you've got that many moments more to achieve before you get that. And we're doing a pretty good job. Another problem we face is the educational resources. So the Hand Hygiene Australia material is all hospital based, which does make it very difficult for our haemodialysis staff to work out when those moments occur in haemodialysis. So what we've done about that, initially Hand Hygiene Australia did a workflow for haemodialysis and I've further adapted that workflow to include aseptic technique and other <coughs> IPC principles in haemodialysis. I've also developed a few PowerPoints with presentations and photos of when, when hand hygiene does occur in haemodialysis. So that's just an example of moment four, after touching a patient, how it relates to haemodialysis. So it's after touching the machine that's attached to a patient. So looking at audit results. So I'm very cautious about just looking at compliance data, the, just the overall compliance, because that can differ depending on the different auditors, the time of auditing, who they're auditing. I've had some, one clinic who was saying they were getting 90% and I'm going, you know, that's really good, but when are you auditing, um, are you auditing all your staff? And we go, oh, we don't audit the bad staff, we only audit the good staff. <laughs> so you've got to be careful with these compliance results. So instead I encourage the clinics to um, have monthly staff meetings and look at one audit moment, preferably um, hand hygiene moment too because that's most important for us, and look at how they can improve it and improve the results for that instead of looking at the overall totals. We also report our results through on our monthly manager meeting. Um, I prepare a six monthly country IPC report that goes to executive management and we also discuss at our clinical governance meetings. Hand hygiene is very related to aseptic technique. You can't do aseptic technique without hand hygiene. So I've found that I'm using the same educational resources for my aseptic technique training tools as the hand hygiene ones. So here you can see that we're looking at aseptic technique, but it's also we're covering hand hygiene moments four and two at the same time. So hand hygiene auditing supports the RPC audits. So for us, when a patient comes in to get that patient ready for dialysis, cannulate them and connect them to the machine, it takes about 20 to 25 minutes to do this. And during that time, it's about 8 to 12 hand hygiene moments occurs. So it's a long time that an auditor is standing there watching a staff member with a patient. So at the same time, they can do all their other IPC audits. So they can look at bare below elbow, other staff got um, watches on. They can look at the personal protective equipment. Are they using their face shields? Sharp safe use and disposal. Have they got the sharps bin right next to them? And also looking at the aseptic technique. So how do we make our hand hygiene program? It happens because of our IPC champions. They're the muscle behind the program. So our IPC champions are a registered nurse. They have one day each month non-patient care. That's the most critical thing that they've actually got one day to do all this work, to coordinate the hand hygiene program, to look at aseptic technique and look at the other IPC issues. So to run this we need a commitment from management. So we need a commitment from myself to develop and implement and coordinate the program. We need a commitment from our managing director. So to get that I presented a business case to him talking about um, that we needed this for our patient safety for, against healthcare associated infections. And also we weren't meeting the criteria for National Standard 3, so we weren't getting the audits done. So he had to financially commit to having one person uh, one day a month off the floor. We also needed a commitment from the dialysis clinic managers. So before we started the program, I did a presentation with the managers, it has to be via teleconference, it's got all of Australia to cover, to explain the IPC Champions program. Also monitor the amount of time that the IPC champions are getting off the floor because they might, the manager might go, oh, I need that, that person, we've got sick leave. So it's man continually supporting the managers to get that person off. We also need a commitment from the IPC champion. So we needed a registered nurse to take on the role. They needed to complete their hand hygiene auditor training. They attend quarterly teleconference meetings and that's where I do a lot of education looking at, we discuss, you know, what's the problems, what's the issues, what's the blockers. They need to coordinate the hand hygiene program. They don't have to do all the audits themselves. There are all the aud auditors, but just making sure the moments are being achieved. 
and they complete the other um, IPC audits and staff education. So how do we measure our success and outcomes? Three of our IPC champions have gone on to become dialysis clinic managers, so it's very good for professional development. This year, uh, achieving the National Hand Hygiene Initiative, 96% of our clinics achieved that. Our hand hygiene compliance has improved. Hand hygiene and IPC audits are being completed. We have minimal transmission of MROs in our clinics, and now it's an embedded cu um, culture in the clinics. I've got the managers coming to me saying, we need more hand hygiene auditors trained. Um, I want to have another support person for my IPC champion. And I'm really happy it's coming from the clinics. It's not coming from me. So this is just showing that in 2013, we started the IPC champion program. So it took a little while of that year to head off and start off. In the meantime, we were continuing um, educating more auditors. But you can see how we're achieving the National Hand Hygiene Initiative moment, required moments, just about all the time with most of our clinics. And that's with the IPC champion having the time to be able to do that. Also with the audits, in 2012, before we started the IPC champion program, we just had a face shield audit and a couple of the clinics were doing hand hygiene audits. With the IPC champions having that time, we'd be able to do a lot more IPC audits and also all the hand hygiene audits. Measuring patient outcomes is very difficult to do in dialysis. Looking at bloodstream infections, we don't have that many bloodstream infections in hemodialysis, so you can't, we can't really use that as a benchmark. So we had a look at uh, multi-resistant organisms and looking at VRE. So of the clinics that we do have data, surveillance data of VRE, so of our population there was about 150 um, patients that we had surveillance data for VRE on. So 55% of those 150 already had VRE or colonised with VRE before they came into our clinics. 43% when they came into our clinics were negative for colonised with VRE and then they'd go off to hospital or another healthcare facility, come back to us and then they would have um, be colonised with VRE. Of those patients who didn't leave, didn't go to hospital, didn't go to another healthcare facility, only 3% um, became colonised with VRE. And I don't know if that was community acquired. It's also really important to involve the patients. So in World Hand Hygiene Day in 2015, we really looked at patient empowerment. So we created a patient hand hygiene brochure. We had the staff wearing badges ask me if I've washed my hands. But also very important with those badges, we had a memo that went out to the staff to educate the staff on how to respond if a patient asks them if they wash their hands. So if a staff member responds negatively, the patient won't ask again. It takes a lot of courage to ask a healthcare person <coughs> to wash their hands. So in 2016, we thought we wanted to do this again because it was kind of just starting in 2015. So for World Hand Hygiene Day, we repeated the same things. But what we also did was we did a survey with the patients. We asked them three questions. Have you seen your staff member wash their hands before they came and touched you? Did they wash their hands before they put gloves on and did a procedure? And have they got their hand hygiene brochure? So the results for that was 97% coming back from the patients, which is very good. But one patient's comment really made me stop and think was that they said that they felt vulnerable commenting on staff nursing care practices in hemodialysis because they have to come back for care. They've got to come back three times a week, mostly for the rest of their lives, for haemodialysis. So for a patient to comment on nursing care it was very difficult for them. So it made me realise that it's different from a hospital. You can ask your patients when they leave hospital what they thought of the, the nursing care. Mostly they're not planning on coming back to hospital, but they know they're going to come back to dialysis. So our future plans is to work with Hand Hygiene Australia to develop a haemodialysis resource page and to develop a specific online learning package. So if you remember My Fair Lady, hand hygiene in haemodialysis happens holistically. Yeah.